Uh, um, motion to approve. Second. Okay. Okay. Second. Here. Okay. Unfinished business. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be walk through our preliminary draft budget, operating capital budget this evening. Uh, Ms. Fian, Mr. Akinkube, and Ms. Galapian are going to be presenting uh, the budget and the CIP. I did want to mention before we start that this is our first budget as a team. So this is the first budget we prepared from front to back. So you see some minor changes in our budget documents, um, as well as the uh, presentation and CIP from last year. Ms. Fian will start off by going through those, but I'll turn it over to her for the presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Brother Ali, and board members. Um, as Mr. Carl said, this is our first go around as a, as a team. Mr. Kube joined in February. Mr. Carl officially started in February. So, budget cycle wise, this is our first budget that we as a team are presenting to you, and we're excited. I think what, what you see tonight is our effort in moving organization and, and the budget itself to be more clear, simple, understandable, especially as we are thinking about our ultimate audience, which is the public. And so one of the things that we did this year was really work or work with our engineering consultants to develop a comprehensive 10-year cash flow that fed into the 10-year CIP, and that's representative of the budgets that we know right now. And so making sure that we had a better understanding of what are, what are budgets going to look like in the long term. Additionally, we were trying to streamline our budget as best as we could. There were subsets of kind of smaller projects that were subsets of bigger initiatives that we're, we're overseeing right now. One good example is that we had last year a centrifuge upgrade project and centrifuges are a key component of our solids process. And so we took projects like that that were really part of a bigger effort and consolidated it, in, it into one large project, which is a solids upgrade project for that that particular project. And then the we had a number of, of studies that were represented in the budget last year and wanted to this year instead incorporate estimates of what that study would result in. So estimating design and implementation costs and kind of it, more having a comprehensive project that's described in, in the budget document. Those are the major pieces of the capital side. And then the budget document itself, you'll see that we rearranged some of the information that's in there. A lot of the, the tables that were presenting fund statements associated with the master indenture of trust moved to an appendix to make the, the actual budget document read more cleanly and simply. Um, one of the things that is in your uh, green folder tonight is just a slide, um, Mr. Hill, it's in front of you. Um, it's a cheat sheet of one of the changes that you'll see tonight that came out of finishing out the budget document in the last week and finalizing from the advanced copy you received last week. And so there are three major changes associated with the capital uh, projects and then one from the operating side. So so that in effect means that what was emailed or delivered to us, the changes you already mentioned is different than the documents are different, are slightly different, but they are different. So the one that is on the table in front of us in the green folder tonight is, is updated and that's the one we should focus on and we should recycle. Yes. Yes, we tried our best to provide an advanced copy but acknowledged that there were still some tweaks that we needed to make on our end. And so what you have in front of you today is the So there are changes just in terms of commas here and there, but the major changes we wanted to highlight are associated with the solids upgrade program. The schedule itself was extended out three additional years to 2037. 
and 50 additional or 50 million additional dollars were added to the capital cost for the project. The program, Ms. Lathian is going to hit on it, but it's really associated with piloting a technology to help us frame out our solids. The tertiary upgrades or system upgrades project, we added additional money into this upcoming year's capital expenses. We went from half a million to 2 million, and that was to advance that project this year. And then lobby, which oh lobby. Thank you. So lobby upgrades, we decreased the total capital cost. And that was, we originally had envisioned fifth floor build out and the lobby upgrades to be one project and then in splitting them, uh, we kept the capital cost associated with the total project and and lobby upgrades and so are decreasing it down to 2 million for that. And then finally on the operating side, uh, we had went from a proposed uh, full-time equivalence of 125 for fiscal year 25 to 126. So added an additional into operating and maintenance. All right, so long lead up to the actual uh, presentation. So I have, We've narrowed it down to just two slides on the, the background um, that is really building off of the last time we gathered for the finance and audit committee in February. I'll hit on those and then Mr. Akin Kube will walk through the status of recommendations that came out of the fiscal 23 audit and then present the fiscal year 2025 preliminary draft. Ms. Babian will walk through the 10 year capital improvement program. I'll hit on the funding for the CIP and then finish it out with what are the next steps for the, the budget cycle. So the these next two slides are just kind of rooting ourselves in what are the two major pieces of what guides us in putting together a, a budget that is that is being presented to you tonight. The first being that in as you're well aware in January this year, the board refreshed our mission, vision, and strategic goals. And what came up out of that from staff standpoint is a strategic plan for the years 2024 through 2029. And the initiatives that are identified in that strategic, strategic plan directly feed the budget that's being pres presented tonight in an effort in driving the organization towards meeting the board's strategic goals. The next, and then the second piece of, of guidance for this, this putting together a budget is that the, the two main Financial documents that guide us putting together a comprehensive budget are the master indenture of trust and the board approved financial policy, which stipulate requirements for what we need to have in the budget, including what are the minimum targets for debt service, for minimum reserves that we need to have on hand, and how much uh, cash is used to fund the capital improvement program, and then um, ultimately that we are presenting a 10 year capital improvement program and three year budget forecast that you see in the budget document. With that, I will pass it over to Mr. Thank you, Ms. Bihan. Again, good afternoon, or I should say good evening, Mr. Chairman, fellow members of the uh, Finance and Audit Committee, and the rest of the board members. I stand before you here today very nervous and anxious and excited at the same time. So hopefully I don't trip myself up. But Heading back to uh, last November 2023, uh, we presented the FY23 audit results during the uh, Finance and Audit Committee. And as we have stated during that presentation that Alex Renew uh, continue to achieve an on, uh, a clean, unmodified opinion, which is the goal. That is the goal of, of this organization. That is the goal of any organization during an audit. What that means, again, uh, is we have a set of financial statements that are well prepared and fairly stated, no misrepresentations so the public or anybody could look into our financial statements and have a full confidence that we have presented this book according to uh, some accounting principles guiding uh, the uh, Alex Renew Authority. Uh, as with any clean audit, most audit, there are usually some recommendations suggested by the uh, auditors. And these are recommendations uh, from best practices 
that suggests to us as an organization, if we want to accept those recommendations, uh, we don't have to accept them. But in this situation, um, in conjunction with Mr. Kyle, Ms. Bian, it's like we agree they are best practices and we've adopted and put in place processes and procedures for those recommendations suggested by the audience. Uh, again, these are not findings. These are just best practices suggestion that uh, they pose to us that we should, you know, we might want to consider uh, adopting this recommendation. Um, again, from a very high level standpoint, I know you've seen this before, but just to a brief summary or overview of it is the first two uh, talks about the uh, asset addition uh, from Alex Renew standpoint, how we go about adding an asset. Their recommendation is to make sure we have processes in place that separates who enters those assets and who approves them to avoid duplication, as well as having a very, very good supporting document to substantiate what was added as an asset. Um, the third item here, this is a recommendation from the auditors um, uh, for the past four years, I believe. And this has to do with one of the reporting that we get from our third party billing company. Uh, what that is in a nutshell is we get a monthly billing report from our third party company. The billing report we've been given by this third party company was, and that was uh, GCWW, was at a summarized level. So one of the audit testing, the auditor's testing is to test that billing report, that summarized report to the agent. The agent report is at a customer detailed level. So they had a hard time. They've had hard time for years just trying to test uh, from billing from a particular customer on the billing report to the agent report. We have soon, uh, with our new third party uh, uh, our vendor, ESC, been able to recreate that report. And we have that report now in place. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jason Moore is very excited to have that report, it makes the uh, reconciliation process a little more easier for him. And this is what the auditors have recommended, too. We have. So now we have that report in place. Yes, sir. How is the new vendor doing in regards to the accuracy and timeliness of their monthly report they're now producing? So far, what we've seen, they've been very responsive and being on time, uh, just from a reporting standpoint and what they've been providing us on a monthly basis. And the quality, the quality, the, 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 the quality has been has, has been very, very good as well. I mean, a few suggestions back and forth on like how we want to see certain things, but they've been very responsive and accommodative. Uh, of what we want so far. Okay. Uh, the fourth item here has to do again with uh, a best practice for segregation of duties uh, as it relates to journal entries. A journal entry is a, a, a it's an accounting entry really to post a transaction, recognizing the transaction. Uh, they recommended that we uh, separate who initiates that transaction from who approves it, Mr. Moore has soon uh, implemented a process, a workflow process that all uh, journal entry transaction comes through him for approval. So in other words, if uh, Ms. Charnette um, puts in a, an entry, it runs through Mr. Moore for, uh, for, for approval. And that's what they would recommend, just segregating who initiates an entry versus who approves. Um, <clears throat> the fourth one, this was, uh, so we already had this process in place. This is how we track uh, one of our loans, which is the, uh, uh, we feel loan, we'll talk more about that to make sure it does not exceed 49% of the uh, River Renewal project. We had this in place already. They just suggested we make it more formal and keep doing what we are doing just to, just to make sure we do not exceed their 49% of the total river renewal cost. And I, I'll talk about, I'll talk more about that on the slide right after this. Um, the sixth one right here, which was to develop an uh, on-claim property listing policy. We actually had this policy during the audit, but with the, uh, for lack of a better term, newness of myself and Mr. Moore, we couldn't locate that policy. We found that policy right after this uh, recommendation was made, and we have revised that policy, updated it, and it's now part of our standard accounting day-to-day -day 
practice and we follow it as well. The last on the list, uh, this was not a recommendation. Um, it was not on the, as a part of the recommendation. So this is one of the new accounting treatment, accounting principles uh, as it relates to IT subscription-based agreements. Uh, this uh, statement was uh, newly introduced to uh, government entities in the past 18 months. So during the FY23 audit, we had about two transactions that were subjected to this treatment. We identified and discussed with the auditors what our processes and criteria are and identify and treat in those. They liked it, they agree with it. They just suggest to us we make that formal throughout the organization in FY 2024. That have we, we've done already as of today. And that summarizes the FY 23 audit results. Any questions? Thank you. Good progress. Thank you. So here, just touching on one of the uh, recommendation, again, we've always had this. This is the breakdown of the river renew spending through January 2024. As you see on your slide, we do have a total spent to date of approximately $401 million. That's approximately about 65% of the estimated project spending, the estimated project spending of $615 million. And again, as you could see on there, are like the funding sources for the River Renewal Project, two of the biggest so far, or three, I should say, are like your top three. The Virginia Clean Water Loan, uh, the Virginia Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund. Uh, we've exhausted that fund fully, uh, approximately 186 million, which uh, through January 2024 accounts for approximately 46 percent of the spend to date. Uh, the other one is the uh, Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, popularly known as the We Feel Loan. To date, we've spent approximately uh, 71 uh, million, uh, uh, 79 million, I should say, roughly about 19.7%. Uh, other main source that we have of uh, uh, grant state grants, we have roughly about, we've spent roughly about 85 million out of the 150 million we have. So out of this 214 million of remaining fund, as you could see, right? Right, to, again, that's about 35% of the total uh, project. Uh, to fund this are mainly going to come from the We Feel Loan and the state grant. So even, so what we're looking at so far now is with the remaining balance on the state grant, that puts the We Feel Loan spent to date. I mean, they'll, they'll put the We Feel Loan at the end of the project, total spent percentage of about 36%. Again, just to, just to elaborate just how uh, in compliance or safe we are, even if we were to expand the remaining 35%, $214 million approximately from the we feel loan, that's not the goal, but even if we were to, it puts the percentage right around 46, 47% of the total project. And the compliance is to make sure we do not go over 49%. So we are well in compliance of uh, our spending track and making sure we are in compliance with our funding sources, particularly uh, the loan the loan that we have. Mr. Claus, anything you'd like to add? Um, sorry, yes. it's been a while since we've talked with you. Was the 49% cap part, uh, was that one of the, the conditions of the loan? Yeah, or, yes. loan agreement. It's in the federal statute. It is the same way. Sorry. How do you track individual expenditures against the source? Do you track it all the way back to the invoice? Yes, sir. We track it all the way back to the invoice and when preceding the invoice or like the purchase order uh, that supports the invoice. It's part of, like I said, it's, a, it's so part of an audit, single audit that we have to go through. That's a very good, time consuming, but a very good practice. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Moore and Mr. Hurley spent both of their time uh, tracking those. 
So you know where every penny goes. Yes, sir. And where the pennies came from. Yes, sir. Okay. So on this slide right here, it's a lot on it, but it's a it's a it, it's a snapshot. Pretty much, you can look at this one slide and pretty much walk away with the entire FY25 operating and capital budget. Uh, as you can see, as a local uh, sub-political division, municipality, uh, whatever you want to label us, we have to have a balanced budget where total expenses equals our revenue funding sources. As you all know, we are publicly funded. We're a nonprofit organization. So this is one of the requirements to have a balanced budget. Looking at the expenses, we have a total capital outlay. Ms. Pian highlighted some of the ongoing project we have, and Ms. Glapion will be talking more about this uh, shortly. Uh, we have roughly about 175.2 million in uh, capital outlay expenses. That's approximately 76% of the entire expenses. A big part of that has to do with our uh, ongoing River Renew project. The River Renew project in it by itself accounts roughly for about 62% of that 175 million capital outlay. Uh, another expenditure is uh, approximately 20 million in debt service. These are primarily for uh, existing debt that we have. We do have a very, very small portion of the new debt that we plan to issue within the next uh, few months, including in that. Uh, about 3% of that balance, but bulk of it has to do with existing debt that we have for FY25. Uh, last but not the least is our operating expense. As Ms. Pian talked about earlier, uh, approximately about 35.3 million of the uh, expenses for FY25. Uh, the initiative driving those expenses uh, we do have, uh, uh, I I even though the capital outlay accounts for about 76% of that, uh, there is a 19% decrease in capital outlay, primarily due uh, to River Renew spending as it's nearing its completion. Uh, you've all seen a lot of communication uh, lately on the progress of uh, the River Renew project. Very exciting. Uh, debt service, again, that's a 20% increase. Uh, again, this is to support the River Renew Solids upgrade and the preliminary primary, primary, preliminary and primary system upgrade. Ms. Bian will be talking a little bit more about that shortly. Um, operating expense, uh, there's a 7% increase from prior year's budget, uh, primarily to invest in uh, employee to remain competitive and making sure we have uh, the top and best talents retaining the top, hiring and retaining the top and best talent out there. Um, again, so adding on to the uh, capital initiatives going on, as you all know, we have River Renew. I talked about accounts for about 62% of this capital outlay. That dollar translates to approximately $108 million for FY25, even though it's nearing its completion date. We have the preliminary and primary system upgrades of approximately 12.4 million for FY25. Solid system upgrades of approximately 9 million and asset management, cybersecurity and other IT projects approximately 6 million. Again, Ms. Glapner will be talking a little bit more about that shortly. Now, moving over to our revenue, our funding sources, uh, three main categories that are driving that as uh, debt proceeds. This is how uh, a lot of our capital projects, almost all, a lot of it, a uh, good 85% of it over a 10 year period are debt funded on average. Uh, so that's how we fund that project upfront. All right, so we have roughly about 116 million in like debt proceeds to fund it, primarily our capital project. A uh, big part of that again is we had talked about the ongoing River Renew project. Uh, Fairfax contribution, uh, we get contributions from Fairfax based on our service agreement on a certain project. That's approximately about 41 million. And we have uh, operating revenues, which are primarily driven from our rate payers, our rates of uh, 73.3 million. Included in our operating revenue is a 10% increase 
from prior year. We'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. Questions so far? Yes, sir. Uh, it's more of a, a request, I guess. Is I'd like to see a chart, and maybe it's in the uh, details and I missed it, uh, of the 73.3 divided up and where it goes. Okay. So, you know, the expenses are over here, the revenues are over here, but they you can't say, okay, the 73.3, you can pick your uh, operating expense and debt service. Okay, that's 55 million. Still 18 million that goes in, in other place. Yes. In addition, I'd be in, interested in, in, in in seeing uh, some, somewhere or additional information provided later um, where the surplus went from uh, fiscal 23. And I assume we've got one, probably going to have one in 24 and what the plan program is that. Yes. Yes. Good. If I may elaborate a little bit on that a little, uh, a little bit. So looking at just our expenses for FY25, and this is our funding sources, we have the operating revenue, we have the contributions we get from uh, Fairfax. Included in this debt service and other proceeds is the cash from our general fund, which is where, the, for lack of a better term, the surpluses and shortages goes into. And every year we pull out of that amount to uh, substitute or to, to make up for any expenditure that exceeds um, revenue excluding the uh, fund balance, but we'll, we'll, we'll be more than happy to uh, proceed, um, uh, pro provide that information to you. But that's where, that's where that goes into, it's called the general fund. And every year we, 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 we tap into that. Some years we might put back into it. All those are factored during the rate model. And we look at all those things before a rate is proposed on, on, on the side. So we'll, we'll, we'll be more than happy to put that. Together. I think that information will be important because we say, uh, rates are going to go up again as we had already approved. Yeah. And then our revenues are going up even or almost double that five, you know, five percent because we're selling uh, more, ser more services than more gallons uh, of water being sold. So <laughs> uh, say, well, where's our money? Where's all that money going? So I think that it will help the other able to tell the story of uh, why the rate increase is necessary, even though we've got surpluses and uh, in our hands. Oh, yes, sir. You want to step up? Next slide. Um, to follow up on, on your point, Mr. Jinks, about when we're looking at funding sources, the total revenue of um, for FY25. And so we do have in here, again, our operating revenue makes up about 30, that makes up about 30% of our funding source. A big part of that, again, is still the debt proceed and other sources makes up about 15%, about 50% of the funding sources. So uh, in a nutshell, our operating revenue supports our operating expenses, debt service, as well as a portion of our capital out, uh, outlay. That's what that 73 million is all used towards. So between our operating expenses and debt service, that's roughly about 55 million right there, remaining 18 million, as uh, uh, Mr. Jinks was talking about, really goes to a portion of our capital outlay. As, as, as I said earlier, about 15% of our capital outlay over a 10 year period has to be cash funded based on our policy. Um, the overall driver from year over year here again drops roughly about 12.4%. This is primarily due to uh, the river renewal spending as it's nearing its completion date. Okay. Uh, any question on this before going to the next slide? Uh, here is uh, like a nine year history of our rates. Um, as you all know, during last year's budget cycle, the board uh, adopted a two year rate increase for FY24 and FY25. Uh, we've implemented uh, those rate goals into effect uh, effective July 1. We've implemented the FY24, the FY25 rates will be implemented effective July 1, 2023. Questions so far? Uh, <clears throat> sir. 
before we move off the previous chart, okay. the the 2020 numbers, the 12.7 percent increase. That so they Mr. Carl may want to allude a little bit more to that, uh, but that was the first, I, I believe that was the first set of our two year rate increases that we started. Uh, there were discussions about what those proposed rate could have been in 20, 2018 and 2019, but I think we got the hard figures put together by 2020. And that's why, again, with the projected amount of how much the project uh, was anticipated to cost us, we did have uh, that one, that, that, mm -hmm. that huge increase in 2020. Mr. Carl, Mr. Carl. It was really 12.7 and then 11 percent. We decreased uh, FY 2021 from 11 to 6.6 6 because of COVID and flattened it out after that. There were originally two big steep increases to keep up with the revenue spending. Remember I, following I, that line? I remember those discussions, but I'm just looking at the graph. And of course, the you know, top of the graph there is the the average average 4,000 gallon user, right? And that user is seeing his monthly bill go from 46 to 50, right? That's, that's 8%, give or take. That's not 12. Not 12. The, so the, the percentage of this rate increase, so the total cost right there includes both Alex Renew and the city charges. The yeah. percentage of the rate increase only represents the Alex yeah. Renew portion of that. Yeah. Oh. Have fun with numbers. <laughs> <laughs> we have a separate slide that just shows the hours over the Correct. The next slide actually talk, I think maybe alluding to what you're trying to get at. Mr. Hill. These are still very reasonable numbers. But thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Next slide. So here is, uh, again, like we said, July 1 included in our revenue estimates uh, is we do have a 5.1. In, uh, increase in rates, and that although we had a 10% increase when you look at our operating revenue from FY24 to FY25, 5.1% of that has to do with uh, the rate in increase already adopted to be implemented July 1, 2024. The other 4.9 really has to do with adjusting our budget because in previous year's budget, those budget uh, uh, factored in low usage. So we, we adjusted our FY25 budget to match what we've been seeing the past two years, which is flows are now returning back uh, to pre-pandemic levels and things like that. Again, all those numbers, the actual numbers factored into our rate consideration, our model, any old ridges and uh, shortages goes into that general fund that I was talking about. All that we look during our rate uh, uh, annual rate forecast to see if our rates are sufficient or not. So looking at the uh, rates from 2024 to what we are going to uh, implement 2025, based on the monthly residential bill of 40 gallons, 4,000 gallons, you could see the dollar impact on the bill. It's the $2.72. That's their 5.1% increase. So the monthly impact on your average residential monthly bill it's approximately two dollars and seventy-two cents. One additional information piece of information I'd like to see is that some some of the math behind the usage assumptions. That that was the source of our surplus last year. <coughs> when you say uh, just to clarify, our uh, source of usage assumption for 2025, 23, 24. I mean, it's so kind of, we're talking about multiple. Multiple years, and because it it's going to uh, accumulate, uh, and just to see what those numbers and assumptions are would be uh, I think helpful. I think it's important to note the last finance and audit committee meeting we went through the rate model. The rate model accurately projected build flows. The budgetary number was incorrect. It did not carry the rate model number that was that was shown in February. Um, we are saying we're getting back on track to. The rate model, and that's why the 5.1% number isn't changing because it was following the, the rate model. Any questions? Slide. Uh, 
as you're all very, very familiar with, uh, our winner quarter average discussions, especially over the last three, four meetings uh, that we've had. So as part of the budget cycle, Alex Renew is proposing to make uh, minor changes, uh, minor modification to its winter quarter average. This change is expected uh, plan to take place effective July 1, 2024. Uh, you're very familiar with what the proposed uh, policy is. The takeaway here is with the new proposed policy, has a slight impact to revenue, very small impact of a decrease of $113,000, and that's already included in the FY25 revenue numbers. Uh, any other questions so far? One point on this, the, there is a draft version of the rate rules and regulation that for this policy is outlined. So we did redline the rate rules and regulations that will go forward with the budget process. The public hearing in May, and it is attached to uh, the board packet under tab two, kind of buried in there. It's got a draft. And it's the same as was sent to us earlier. Yeah. This so it doesn't matter which version we look at. No, yeah, no changes to rate rules. And there were some other minor modifications when you go through that document regarding disconnections. Some there's some very old language in there that we is not encoded anymore. We have talked the winter quarter. Beat this dead horse to death. Right? Yeah, he's, no, he's, he's, he's going to stay down, I think. <laughs> move on to implementation. Yeah. I'll just keep the process to the city going through the same process, same time we are. So they will um, be looking at this to adopt this in conjunction with us in, in July. Okay, so um, this slide here highlights the FY25 operating expenses. That accounts for roughly about 20% of the entire FY25 total expenses. And our operating expenses here, these are expenses used for our day to day uh, operation here at Alex Renew. The category ranges from util uh, personnel, utilities, chemical maintenance sewage disposal, sludge disposal, and uh, miscellaneous other categories. Uh, as with most operating expenses, the biggest part of it is usually your personnel. So uh, from FY24 to FY25, FY25 has an operating expense of 35.3 million. That's a 6.9% increase from FY24 budget numbers. 50% uh, of that 35.3 is attributed to our personnel, uh, cost of 17.2 million. Uh, coincidentally, too, as you can see, the increase in personnel from year over year is actually 6.9, primarily driving the uh, annual increase year over year. And this is as we make investments to our employee, making sure we are hiring and retaining the top talent to do what we do on it day-to-day basis. Um, going down the categories right here, uh, utility remains fairly flat to last year's uh, budget. Chemicals uh, up 6.7%. Some of this uh, percentages are may be a little alarming compared to the actual dollars, uh, but chemicals is going up 6.7%, approximately 300,000 from last year's budget. And we are seeing that trend actually right now in our FY24 numbers. Uh, operational maintenance went up 500,000, approximately 38.1%. That might seem a little alarming, but what's really driving that 500,000 is there was approximately 400,000 from other expense category. This last category that we had to reclass in FY25 to the operation maintenance uh, category. That's kind of like what's driving that. So to rephrase that, and then you look there, you're like, what was I trying to say? To try to rephrase that, there was, there's an expense now in this category right here in FY25 that used to be in this category uh, right here. As we went through our audit and we go through our financial statement, we identified like, oh, that expense really should be in the operation maintenance. So it's not really, uh, it's not, let, let me rephrase it this way. Uh, assuming, assuming that uh, 400,000 has stayed here, 
the percent increase here will have been about 3.8 percent. That was going to be my question. <laughs> and the increase here will have been closer to five percent. If that if, 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 if that makes sense. Um, uh, the Arlington sewage disposal is going up about 300,000, about 18%. Uh, that's just due they have a higher operating budget that they've sent to us. And we factored that and uh, in increment, uh, implemented that into uh, 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 FY25 numbers. Again, overall operating budget is going up approximately 2.3 million, 6.9% primarily driven by uh, personnel costs, which accounts for roughly about 50% of the operating budget. And the next slide talks a little bit more about personnel, but before I go to that, any other questions so far on the operating expenses? So here's the breakdown of uh, personnel expenses. As Ms. Pian said earlier, we are going up roughly about 1.5 FTE from FY24. We have Y25 as we continue to make investments in our, our workforce. Uh, and this breaks it down on salaries and wages and fringe benefits. Salaries and wages is going up approximately 400,000, again, primarily due to employee compensation adjustment to stay competitive and uh, keep investing in our staff. Uh, and uh, the fringe benefit Question is going, that. I'm sorry. On that line, what, could you describe that a little more? What? increases are proposed for yeah so in wait, I'm sorry, I'm just... two, two things uh one we did add additional personnel and we are planning a meeting to go through the entire uh compensation study that we're completing right now so we're gonna we were going to plan for a finance and audit committee meeting i don't know if we're gonna get that in so at our next board meeting we're going to walk through the compensation study in detail show how we compare what the recommendations are what assumptions were made for the budget to try and do that within the budget cycle uh, that's why we didn't have one here tonight because we didn't have the results back yet um, because we were halfway through that, that process. So in addition to that, we'd also like to go back and look at our compensation philosophy. That's why I mentioned the governance committee as well. So, so maybe more of a contingent in these but, numbers. Correct. The yep. details of the study. So I think we want to kind of hold tight on going through the detail on the personnel piece until we have the results from the study back and can sit down and go through them fully. Uh, Mr. Carl, do you want to talk about the logistics of that now or maybe at the end of this meeting? Just when do we want to do the governance meeting and when we want to bring this to the board? I think we want to have as much time as humanly possible to get, because we're not getting the results back. No, I understand. Before the board meeting. So okay. they're coming in like oh, two weeks before and we want, to, we want to send the packet out, have the information spread in advance. We'd like to keep the board meeting scheduled and maybe come back for a governance meeting to look at the philosophy. So the board the meeting, April, April board meeting. Yeah, April board meeting, we planned, we'd like to go through the compensation study and then introduce the ideas that we have in the philosophy. And then what we want to change, we could always have a governance meeting later to go through the details of the philosophy. Yeah. I just want to make sure we're supporting you in, in going through this in detail. I mean. Yeah, I just I I don't well, think we're on the staff is critical. I don't think we're going to make it in advance, and I want to make sure we're supporting that effort. Yeah, but I think our assumption we're roughly a four percent increase, you know, across the staff level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Carroll, what about the compensation? other matrix or other um, <clears throat> things that are in these numbers that you really can see uh, right now. Currently, our Alex Renew has roughly about 120 FTEs as of this month. Uh, historically, we've averaged about 104, 105. So that means we've had roughly about 15 more uh, staff in-house. Uh, our, our turnover rate actually dropped when you look at the last 12 year, uh, 12 month has dropped to approximately 13 percent and that's 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 the best number um, that we've seen in the past 10 years and a lot of it has to do with the changing culture led by mr carl as well as new leadership and uh stuff like that so uh we we're not seeing as much folks leave as we've seen in the past and uh we've seen definitely a higher retention 
on that too. But as Mr. Carl said, uh, I guess from the comp study, we'll, a lot of this will be uh, reviewed too. In that data. That's great, by the way, that having your turnover rate drop is not only just great for culture, but also cost savings and recruitment, et cetera. So, yeah, definitely amazing. Well, as a point of what was that rate at its worst? I mean, it was 20, 20 ish, 7%. A little higher than that, Mr. Carl. 32%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A base of 120 employees. Move lots of that. Okay. That's an incredible accomplishment to bring it down so quickly. Absolutely. So we're at 9%. <laughs> Numbers are funny things. <laughs> okay. Um, this slide right here again just talks about highlights our capital outlay year over year and the components making up those uh, categories of the capital outlay. Overall, again, we are seeing a drop in our capital outlay of approximately 18% was driving that is the river renewal project as it's nearing its completion. So not as much spend in river renewal as we've seen in prior years, even though river renew still accounts for over 60%, 70% uh, of the capital outlay, I should say. So even though, as you could see, we're seeing the river renew uh, drop off year over year, uh, one thing you are seeing is our general CIP is going up now that we have time to focus on other projects such as the silence upgrade, preliminary and primary system upgrade, tertiary system upgrades, and the information technology project. And Ms. Clapkin will be talking a little bit more about this in the next few slides. Um, questions so far here, and I'm going to turn over to Ms. Clapkin to uh, talk over a few of the uh, capital outlay slides. Thanks, Lake. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board. Uh, so what you see here is a visual representation of our capital budget for this year. Uh, so of the $230 million budget that Lake mentioned, 175 of that is attributed to capital projects. And you can see that our greatest expenditure continues to be the River Renew project at about 60% of the budget. We've got a smaller allocation towards our IRR projects, which is more of our maintenance type projects. And then the remainder of that, about 30%, is attributed to some of our larger capital projects. Maybe not so large compared to River Renew, but large for us. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of those projects uh, in the next few slides. Uh, so it's going to be a mix of stuff happening here on our campus, as well as projects on the institution system. So wastewater treatment, as well as conveyance projects, are scheduled for the upcoming year. Uh, one of the ones I want to highlight is our solids program. Uh, so this has to do with removing not only the uh, solids coming in with our wastewater as far as trash and grit and figuring out how to handle those things, but also mainly the biologicals that are produced through the wastewater treatment uh, process. So the focus of this program is to improve the reliability of our existing solids program as well as plan for our solids future. So this is an ongoing effort that we started in previous years. We're currently in the process of um, creating a solids master plan that's looking at, hey, what do we need to do in the short term to make our system more reliable? What do we need to do five to 10 years from now in the midterm? And what do we need to do long term? So we kind of have a 20 year planning horizon. So this is a continuation of that effort. Um, as part of the solids master planning project, uh, we identified some immediate fixes or short term things that need to be done right now. And so for this year, we're proposing to move into the final design of those improvements, as well as finish the procurement of CMAR contractor. So the final design of the immediate improvements, as well as starting the construction of some of those recommended improvements in this year. And then we're going to continue our solids master planning efforts while this is going on. And so out of our $250 million capital budget for the whole entire program, we're expecting to spend about 9 million of that this year. Um, so Caitlin alluded to earlier, we had a, a slight increase in our total capital because we're looking at um, what it would take to pilot some of the new technologies and initial estimates are putting that at about 50 million. So this is a slight change from what you might have seen in the draft budget. And this project or this program is continue, is expected to continue through 2037. When are you in, sorry, no, no, go ahead. Uh, when are you anticipating your solids master plan to be done? 
Um, probably within the next year. That's what we're looking at timing wise. You talk about new technology. The equipment that's familiar to us today, you know, the centrifuges and all that stuff. Is all that getting replaced? Uh, not all of it. Some of it is staying in place to support future technology. So we're renewing some of the assets we have now to meet our immediate needs. And we're looking at um, what assets we might still have in place as we pivot to future technologies. But it's going to depend on, you know, the changing regulatory landscape, um, what happens in the industry. Some of the some of the technologies are still pretty new. So kind of letting some of those develop over time before we think about implementing them, but figuring out what's going to be the best solution for Alex Renew long term. Anything to add? I think this is a, you know, you'll see the biggest delta between this from what we had in FY 24 to 25. I think because as Ms. Galapia, I mentioned, there is so much changing in the landscape of new solids. And one, we need to upgrade our solids process. Now we need to get some immediate improvements done to it to make it reliable. The second piece is how we're dealing with PFAS. And there is looming circular circular legislation coming out of uh, EPA that could, I don't want to sound doomsday, but it could affect how we currently land apply our solids. All of our solids that we have today, uh, three trucks per day are taken to a farm somewhere in Virginia and land applied. That Apple cart could possibly get upset by the new EPA ruling for biosolids. So we're we're trying to react to that. There is that's why, as Ms. Glapian mentioned, we have this like medium term solution. Our goal is to get reliable and then reduce solids as much as humanly possible. And you can do that by drying. You can do that through that drying takes it from three trucks to two to one truck per day, something like that. Incineration probably isn't possible here. But looking for a regional partner might be. Um, but right now we're looking at then that long term solution has not yet been not just us. Everybody's facing this has not the long term solution has not yet been identified. Whether it's hydrothermal liquefaction paralysis, what is that long term solid solution that's going to work for somebody like Alex Renew? I think we'll be able to get to a medium term solution where we have less solids coming out the back end of our plant. And that's why you saw some of the changes in the numbers between this year and last. And what Ms. Fian mentioned before is trying, trying to pull some of those other upgrades under the solid umbrella. This is by far our biggest challenge looking ahead. And I think we talked about this at the board retreat. Looking ahead, it's this project. This is our next 20 years. This is almost half of River Renew. Right. But it's I just fortunately spread out. It would be stretched out there. Correct. We don't have the long term technology to get out of that. There's no magic bullet yet that's been tested. Everything's on, on a on a bench scale or pilot scale for dealing with PFAS. Yeah, and to kind of get you so familiar with some of our infrastructure, um, this is one of our gravity thickeners that we're looking at addressing as part of this project. So it's pretty pretty big space. You can't really tell the scale from this this photo, but. Um, another project that we're undertaking is on the liquid side. Um, so this is our preliminary primary treatment project that I think Lake mentioned earlier. And the purpose of this is to you know, improve the performance and operability of our treatment processes at the head of the plant. So right when water gets the plant, what happens to it? You know, it goes through screenings to remove trash and large potables. It goes through grit processing to remove the grit from the wastewater. And it also goes through um, primary settling. So that's what's going to happen under this project. This is also an ongoing initiative that was started in previous years. So the focus of this year is to move into final design um, through the recommendations put forth in the, in the preliminary engineering report, and then also to finish the procurement for construction manager at risk to actually implement uh, construction. So of the $80 million budget proposed for this, um, we expect to spend about $12 million this year, and this project is going to continue through 2029. Questions on this? Um, some of the other small, relatively smaller projects going on will be something this year. A mix of stuff happening here on the campus and also stuff outside of the fence or within the city limits. Um, so we've got some of the interceptor projects that Caitlin touched on earlier. So the Homes Run Truck Sewer Rehab that's looking at rehabilitating 
portion of that interceptor. We've also got the Commonwealth um, wet weather study going on as well to, to see how best to address wet weather flows coming into that asset. We're working with the city on that project, evaluating alternatives uh, to address that. We've got River Renew, which is ongoing, which we've already talked about a lot tonight, so I won't spend too much time on that. But then we've also got some IT upgrades going on. So um, what do we need to do as an organization uh, to refresh our hardware and software, you know, to position us to address emerging cyber threats, as well as to keep us operational and to be able to run our assets, those that are automated. Um, and then finally, we've got the tertiary system upgrades that we're looking into, which is a liquid process, but it's looking at um, our filters, as well as our tertiary settling tanks and what we need to do to make those more reliable and make sure that they continue to operate as intended as we continue to meet um, challenges. Question for you, um, information technology upgrades, are we at the point that we know if the specific elements are going to be in that six million or is it, we know it's gonna be a lot of money and it's more of a set aside until you get into the details of, of designing or pricing the various pieces. A big chunk, a big chunk of it, our asset management system goes live this year. So we have our payment in there. We can break down that six million to show what it what it means. But it's as Mr. Akin Kube mentioned, a, a big chunk of that is asset management. There is some IT upgrades in there as well as the cy ongoing cyber. Okay. So of course, you know, we've got a lot going on in the coming year. Are you can move to the next slide. Uh, so here, here's some of the, the major projects in the 10 year CIP. Um, so some of this information, this information is all in the existing budget, but here's just kind of a breakdown. So some of the projects that I talked about are, are here listed on the project side, along with the estimated uh, capital spend over the next 10 years, and then the faith that we expect to be in for these projects in 2025. Uh, and then on the far right, you'll see kind of what the cash flow looks like over the next 10 years or so. Excuse me. We just talked about the information technology upgrades. Where does that fit in here? Um, it didn't make the list. Yeah, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it yeah, these are all the, yeah, that's right. So, so it's smaller, but it's fine. <laughs> there's, I'm sure there's a, there's a table in there, but it's just not on the slide. It's in there. Yeah. So we've got some major investments in IT, and then it will become more of a, a kind of a maintenance going forward. So that looks like a billion dollars over 10 years. Eight, 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 eight and change. 800 and change. 800 and change. Big numbers. Even by the Washington standard. But that's what it takes to be state of the art. I think this graph is very helpful because you look at those numbers, but then you realize a lot of those are spread out over five, ten years. So and, you know, this is just an estimate based on the information we have now and the studies we have now. As we get better concrete data, um, this will evolve. Obviously, this is what we know now. It'll get to the billion to sheet. Yeah. So speaking of money and how we're going to pay for this, Caitlin's going to give a little bit of insight on how the funding for this checks out. Just so the board knows, we are working jointly with the city now on the Commonwealth study of the joint project. They're doing analysis. We're doing analysis as well. Some of the data we, we, we just don't have. So we have planned to do a joint presentation to the board coming up this spring to give you an update on Commonwealth on where we stand. Is the seven, it'd be, it'd be a joint presentation with Alex and Is 72.2 just kind of the ballpark of what? That is that is assuming that Alex Renew takes on the entire responsibility to upgrade the economy from current size to 48 inches. That's the uh, worst case scenario. No, for us, from a budget standpoint. Sure. Yeah. That's been carried, I think, for the last. No, this will be the third year it's carried. <coughs> so the. The result of the of the uh, coordination of the city will determine what we end up doing long term, and we are on the Pelt agenda for April eighth for this project specifically, and it will be present presented jointly with Aaron from the city. 
that is a very positive development. Agreed. Very positive. So, uh, looking at our, this, this slide uh, illustrates what our intended 10 year expenses are for the next 10 years, and then the funding sources for how we would pay for that, the 10 year capital improvement program. Uh, generally, we pay for capital via loans, grants, contributions from Fairfax County, and then cash. And so, right now, we have anticipated how that breakdown would look for the 10-year capital improvement program. One of the things I, I wanted to point out on this slide is that at the February Finance and Audit Committee meeting, we talked about that the rate model includes contingency money and out years uh, to compensate for our, our plan, engineers planning approach to a 10-year capital improvement pro program. And so there's about $27 million over three years to basically kind of bring up and buffer for potential projects in the future that we might not yet anticipate. So part of that that funding strategy for our capital improvement program includes issuing or proposing to issue $70 million of new debt via public funds uh, that we would be uh, issuing this year. And so what's shown on this slide is our existing debt both in gray and then for River Newman Green and Blue, and then adding in that $70 million of new debt. And so that 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 proposed debt, we would be going through the process right now. We are working with our financial advisor and legal to develop the documents and go. Um, we will be coming to the board in May to share the, the proposed documents and then closing in June. So as Part of that, or as part of that conversation on the next slide, Lorna, we're, we acknowledge that rates, that there are some indications that the Federal Reserve is going to decrease rates. And obviously, rates are at a, a significantly high rate. And we want to be planning this uh, bond sale to be advantageous to outstanding as best as, as we can. The conversations that we have been having with our financial advisors to ensure that. We aren't getting out too far in front of uh, rates coming down. This is a, a chart that we did get from PFM, um, who's our financial advisor, and it just shows what is forecast over the between right here where we are in, in March and then up to January of 2025, um, what's projected for the 30 year municipal bonds. And generally, there is a greater impact anticipated for the two year and 10 year municipal bonds and less of an impact. Uh, predicted right now for the the thirty year municipal bonds, which we would be um, we would be issuing. And so, the the recommendation from our financial advisor is to just continue to stay the course. Obviously, we have some time still before we go to the rating agencies, but it's something that we're we're keeping an eye on. Bad news is we just have consent rates. Uh, bad news is won't come down as much as the Fed's going to drop. However, they didn't go up as much. As the Fed went up, so they're kind of um, more st they're more stable, which is which is overall. So uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, so it's uh, we we've, we've already gotten the advantage of the upside market because uh, rates didn't go up as much as they might have otherwise. It means it'll probably be pretty pretty flat going forward. Uh, and if it's not, then I assume we have a couple of provisions when we put in the bond so that if rates drop, we can refine it. So you're not stuck for 20 years, 30 years. We'll have those done in, in, a, in a decade. In the, the next year. And then, so closing out tonight's presentation is just what is anticipated for the budget cycle for the next couple of months. So tonight we are presenting the budget as well as the proposed mid quarter policy adjustments. The idea is that finance and audit committee would be recommending the budget and the, the policy adjustments to the board tomorrow night. And then in the April board meeting, 
there would be a board action to approve the budget and policy adjustments for uh, public notice so that we could be presenting the budget, the policy adjustments at a public hearing in May to receive public comments and that the board would be then subsequently approving in June. And the only other thing is I did mention that the bond or the board will, will consider the documents associated with the bond in May in anticipation that we would close in June. Discuss. Yeah, I, th I think our, our goal tomorrow night would be to answer some of these questions uh, with some slides tomorrow evening so the board feels comfortable with the, the budget document. So I drafted down the, a breakdown of the operating expenses, the build, pro, build flow projections for our revenue. We'll break down the IT project sheet. We'll update that for tomorrow. IT cyber assets. And I think that was... That everything. I'm not sure if I captured it all, but uh, and I think that we have uh, obviously we're not uh, adopting an opportunity to ask questions. Right. Uh, um, uh, we were staffed uh, with the CEO directly. Uh, I know last year I had a, a long list and had a chance to, to do that yet. Uh, and uh, so I'll well, have some questions. We tried to answer any questions that we might have looking at this in comparison to last year through the presentation this evening. So hopefully, hopefully we got ahead of, ahead of some of the questions a little bit. I think the big one for us was, you know, looking at solids and some of the other changes that you saw in the budget. But, um, we'd also like feedback on the budget document itself, you know, good or bad, you know, whether or not it reads more cleanly than compared to those years in the past. But I think when we sat down to kind of restructure this a little bit, it, Made a lot of sense to push a lot of those tables into the end of season. You know, we did not, one thing we did not get to do this this time around is try and tie the budget to the new strategic goals. Um, each project sheet does have it, but the actual budget itself does not have a breakdown of where the money goes. Goal. I thought the budget was just a lot easier to read than previous years, a lot more white space. A lot easier to follow. Yeah. And, I, and I have to say, your presentation today was superb. I mean, it really was superb. A lot of thought went into it. I wish more members of the public could see it. Because it really is an incredible presentation of a public organization's use of their money. I would actually, this is um, a really good snapshot. Uh, it, I pulled it out, obviously, because as you were going through, I was looking at it. I mean, I agree with Mark that kind of tying the operating expenses to our um, our the increase in revenue, why we're still raising rates makes sense. But if there's a way to potentially do that using this, I think would be helpful for the budget document for the public, like maybe as just like a executive summary, whatever you want to call it. But um, this has really helped me kind of follow. Those charts pushed to the back no longer like pushing your way through trying to like what is that trying to tell me and didn't i see those numbers turn this way somewhere so yeah, there was some hard so swimming in that document yeah, yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's, it's getting to tell the story tell the story the way the reader understands yeah. it tell them. any other questions comments staff no Motion to move the draft budget forward to the board. So much. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any further business come to the committee? Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Move second. Right. <laughs> Thank you for being here for this. Get her in, get her in the back and box. I was four minutes late. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to go. She says, she's cute. It was cute. <laughs>